Chapter Twenty Seven of The New Magdalen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Warren Cotty, Gurney, Illinois. The New Magdalen by Wilkie Collins. Chapter Twenty Seven Magdalen's Apprenticeship mr julian gray has asked me to tell him and to tell you mr holmcroft how my troubles began they began before my recollection they began with my birth my mother as i have heard her say ruined her prospects when she was quite a young girl by a marriage with one of her father's servants the groom who rode out with her she suffered poor creature the usual penalty of such conduct as hers after a short time she and her husband were separated on the condition of her sacrificing to the man whom she had married the whole of the little fortune that she possessed in her right gaining her freedom my mother had to gain her daily bread next her family refused to take her back she attached herself to a company of strolling players she was earning a bare living in this way when my father accidentally met with her he was a man of high rank proud of his position and well known in the society of that time for his many accomplishments and his refined tastes my mother's beauty fascinated him he took her from the strolling players and surrounded her with every luxury that a woman could desire in a house of her own I don't know how long they lived together i only know that my father at the time of my first recollections had abandoned her she had excited his suspicions of her fidelity suspicions which cruelly wronged her as she declared to her dying day i believe her because she was my mother but i cannot expect others to do as i did i can only repeat what she said my father left her absolutely penniless he never saw her again and he refused to go to her when she sent to him in her last moments on earth she was back again among the strolling players when i first remember her it was not an unhappy time for me i was the favorite pet and plaything of the poor actors they taught me to sing and to dance at an age when other children are just beginning to learn to read at five years old i was in what is called the profession and had made my poor little reputation in booths at country fairs as early as that mr holmcroft i had begun to live under an assumed name the prettiest name they could invent for me to look well in the bills it was sometimes a hard struggle for us in bad seasons to keep body and soul together learning to sing and dance in public often meant learning to bear hunger and cold in private when i was apprenticed to the stage and yet i have lived to look back on my days with the strolling players as the happiest days of my life i was ten years old when the first serious misfortune that i can remember fell upon me my mother died worn out in the prime of her life and not long afterward the strolling company brought to the end of its resources by a succession of bad seasons was broken up i was left on the world a nameless penniless outcast with one fatal inheritance god knows i can speak of it without vanity after what i have gone through the inheritance of my mother's beauty my only friends were the poor starved out players two of them husband and wife obtained engagements in another company and i was included in the bargain the new manager by whom i was employed was a drunkard and a brute one night i made a trifling mistake in the course of the performances and i was savagely beaten for it perhaps i had inherited some of my father's spirit without i hope also inheriting my father's pitiless nature however that may be i resolved no matter what became of me never again to serve the man who had beaten me i unlocked the door of our miserable lodging at daybreak the next morning and at ten years old 
with my little bundle in my hand i faced the world alone my mother had confided to me in her last moments my father's name and the address of his house in london he may feel some compassion for you she said though he feels none for me try him i had a few shillings the last pitiful remains of my wages in my pocket and i was not far from london but i never went near my father child as i was i would have starved and died rather than go to him i had loved my mother dearly and i hated the man who had turned his back on her when she lay on her deathbed it made no difference to me that he happened to be my father does this confession revolt you you look at me mr holmcroft as if it did think a little sir does what i have just said condemn me as a heartless creature even in my earliest years what is a father to a child when the child has never sat on his knee and never had a kiss or a present from him if we had met in the street we should not have known each other perhaps in after days when i was starving in london i may have begged my father without knowing it and he may have thrown his daughter a penny to get rid of her without knowing it either what is there sacred in the relations between father and child when they are such relations as these even the flowers of the field cannot grow without light and air to help them how is a child's love to grow with nothing to help it my small savings would have been soon exhausted even if i had been old enough and strong enough to protect them myself as things were my few shillings were taken from me by gypsies i had no reason to complain they gave me food in the shelter of their tents and they made me of use to them in various ways after a while hard times came to the gypsies as they had come to the strolling players some of them were imprisoned the rest were dispersed it was the season for hop gathering at the time i got employment among the hop pickers next and that done i went to london with my new friends i have no wish to weary and pain you by dwelling on this part of my childhood in detail it will be enough if i tell you that i sank lower and lower until i ended in selling matches in the street my mother's legacy got me many a sixpence which my matches would never have charmed out of the pockets of strangers if i had been an ugly child my face which was destined to be my greatest misfortune in after years was my best friend in those days is there anything mr holmcroft in the life i am now trying to describe which reminds you of a day when we were out walking together not long since i surprised and offended you i remember and it was not possible for me to explain my conduct at the time do you recollect the little wandering girl with the miserable faded nosegay in her hand who ran after us and begged for a halfpenny i shocked you by bursting out crying when the child asked us to buy her a bit of bread now you know why i was so sorry for her now you know why i offended you the next day by breaking an engagement with your mother and sisters and going to see that child in her wretched home after what i have confessed you will admit that my poor little sister in adversity had the first claim on me let me go on i am sorry if i have distressed you let me go on the forlorn wanderers of the street have as i found it one way always open to them of presenting their sufferings to the notice of their rich and charitable fellow-creatures they have only to break the law and they make a public appearance in a court of justice if the circumstances connected with their offence are of an interesting kind they gain a second advantage they are advertised all over england by a report in the newspapers yes even i have my knowledge of the law i know that it completely overlooked me as long as i respected it but on two different occasions it became my best friend when i set it at defiance my first fortunate offence was committed when i was just twelve years old it was evening time i was half dead with starvation the rain was falling the night was coming on i begged openly loudly as only a hungry child can beg 
an old lady in a carriage at a shop door complained of my importunity the policeman did his duty the law gave me a supper and shelter at the station house that night i appeared at the police court and questioned by the magistrate i told my story truly it was the everyday story of thousands of children like me but it had one element of interest in it i confessed to having had a father he was then dead who had been a man of rank and i owned just as openly as i owned everything else that i had never applied to him for help in resentment of his treatment of my mother this incident was new i suppose it led to the appearance of my case in the newspapers the reporters further served my interests by describing me as pretty and interesting subscriptions were sent to the court a benevolent married couple in a respectable sphere of life visited the workhouse to see me i produced a favorable impression on them especially on the wife i was literally friendless i had no unwelcome relatives to follow me and claim me the wife was childless the husband was a good-natured man it ended in their taking me away with them to try me in service i have always felt the aspiration no matter how low i may have fallen to struggle upward to a position above me to rise in spite of fortune superior to my lot in life perhaps some of my father's pride may be at the root of this restless feeling in me it seems to be a part of my nature it brought me into this house and it will go with me out of this house is it my curse or my blessing i am not able to decide on the first night when i slept in my new home i said to myself they have taken me to be their servant i will be something more than that they shall end in taking me for their child before i had been a week in the house i was the wife's favorite companion in the absence of her husband at his place of business she was a highly accomplished woman greatly her husband's superior in cultivation and unfortunately for herself also his superior in years the love was all on her side excepting certain occasions on which he roused her jealousy they lived together on sufficiently friendly terms she was one of the many wives who resigned themselves to be disappointed in their husbands and he was one of the many husbands who never know what their wives really think of them her one great happiness was in teaching me i was eager to learn i made rapid progress at my pliant age i soon acquired the refinements of language and manner which characterized my mistress it is only the truth to say that the cultivation which has made me capable of personating a lady was her work for three happy years i lived under that friendly roof i was between fifteen and sixteen years of age when the fatal inheritance from my mother cast its first shadow on my life one miserable day the wife's motherly love for me changed in an instant to the jealous hatred that never forgives can you guess the reason the husband fell in love with me i was innocent i was blameless he owned it himself to the clergyman who was with him at his death by that time years had passed it was too late to justify me he was at an age when i was under his care when men are usually supposed to regard women with tranquillity if not with indifference it had been the habit of years with me to look on him as my second father in my innocent ignorance of the feeling which really inspired him i permitted him to indulge in little paternal familiarities with me which inflamed his guilty passion his wife discovered him not i no words can describe my astonishment and my horror when the first outbreak of her indignation forced on me the knowledge of the truth on my knees i declared myself guiltless on my knees i implored her to do justice to my purity and my youth at other times the sweetest and the most considerate of women jealousy had now transformed her to a perfect fury she accused me of deliberately encouraging him she declared she would turn me out of the house with her own hands like other easy-tempered men her husband had reserves of anger in him which it was dangerous to provoke 
when his wife lifted her hand against me he lost all self-control on his side he openly told her that life was worth nothing to him without me he openly avowed his resolution to go with me when i left the house the maddened woman seized him by the arm i saw that and saw no more i ran out into the street panic-stricken a cab was passing i got into it before he could open the house door and drove to the only place of refuge i could think of a small shop kept by the widowed sister of one of our servants here i obtained shelter for the night the next day he discovered me he made his vile proposals he offered me the whole of his fortune he declared his resolution say what i might to return the next day that night by the help of the good woman who had taken care of me under cover of darkness as if i had been to blame i was secretly removed to the east end of london and placed under the charge of a trustworthy person who lived in a very humble way by letting lodgings here in a little back garret at the top of the house i was thrown again on the world an age when it was doubly perilous for me to be left to my own resources to earn the bread i ate and the roof that covered me i claim no credit to myself young as i was placed as i was between the easy life of vice and the hard life of virtue for acting as i did the man simply horrified me my natural impulse was to escape from him but let it be remembered before i approach the saddest part of my sad story that i was an innocent girl and that i was at least not to blame forgive me for dwelling as i have done on my early years i shrink from speaking of the events that are still to come in losing the esteem of my first benefactress i had in my friendless position lost all hold on an honest life except the one frail hold of needlework the only reference of which i could now dispose was the recommendation of me by my landlady to a place of business which largely employed expert needlewomen it is needless for me to tell you how miserably work of that sort is remunerated you have read about it in the newspapers as long as my health lasted i contrived to live and to keep out of debt few girls could have resisted as long as i did the slowly poisoning influences of crowded workroom insufficient nourishment and almost total privation of exercise my life as a child had been a life in the open air it had helped to strengthen a constitution naturally hardy naturally free from all taint of hereditary disease but my time came at last under the cruel stress laid on it my health gave way i was struck down by low fever and sentence was pronounced on me by my fellow lodgers ah poor thing her troubles will soon be at an end the prediction might have proved true i might never have committed the errors and endured the sufferings of after years if i had fallen ill in another house but it was my good or my evil fortune i dare not say which to have interested in myself in my sorrows an actress at a suburban theatre who occupied the room under mine except when her stage duties took her away for two or three hours in the evening this noble creature never left my bedside ill as she could afford it her purse paid my inevitable expenses while i lay helpless the landlady moved by her example accepted half the weekly rent of my room the doctor with the christian kindness of his profession would take no fees all that the tenderest care could accomplish was lavished on me my youth and my constitution did the rest i struggled back to life and then i took up my needle again it may surprise you that i should have failed having an actress for my dearest friend to use the means of introduction thus offered to me to try the stage especially as my childish training had given me in some small degree a familiarity with the art i had only one motive for shrinking from an appearance at the theatre but it was strong enough to induce me to submit to any alternative that remained no matter how hopeless it might be if i showed myself on the public stage my discovery by the man from whom i had escaped would be only a question of time 
i knew him to be habitually a playgoer and a subscriber to a theatrical newspaper i had even heard him speak of the theatre to which my friend was attached and compare it advantageously with places of amusement of far higher pretensions sooner or later if i joined the company he would be certain to go and see the new actress the bare thought of it reconciled me to returning to my needle before i was strong enough to endure the atmosphere of the crowded workroom i obtained permission as a favor to resume my occupation at home surely my choice was the choice of a virtuous girl and yet the day when i returned to my needle was the fatal day of my life i had now not only to provide for the wants of the passing hour i had my debts to pay it was only to be done by toiling harder than ever and by living more poorly than ever i soon paid the penalty in my weakened state of leading such a life as this one evening my head turned suddenly giddy my heart throbbed frightfully i managed to open the window and to let the fresh air into the room and i felt better but i was not sufficiently recovered to be able to thread my needle i thought to myself if i go out for half an hour a little exercise may put me right again i had not as i suppose been out more than ten minutes when the attack from which i suffered in my room was renewed there was no shop near in which i could take refuge i tried to ring the bell of the nearest house door before i could reach it i fainted in the street how long hunger and weakness left me at the mercy of the first stranger who might pass by it is impossible for me to say when i partially recovered my senses i was conscious of being under shelter somewhere and having a wine glass containing some cordial drink held to my lips by a man i managed to swallow i don't know how little or how much the stimulant had a very strange effect on me reviving me at first it ended in stupefying me i lost my senses once more when i next recovered myself the day was breaking i was in a bed in a strange room a nameless terror seized me i called out three or four women came in whose faces betrayed even to my inexperienced eyes the shameless infamy of their lives i started up in bed i implored them to tell me where i was and what had happened spare me i can say no more not long since you heard miss roseberry call me an outcast from the streets now you know as god is my judge i am speaking the truth now you know what made me an outcast and in what measure i deserved my disgrace her voice faltered her resolution failed her for the first time give me a few minutes she said in low pleading tones if i try to go on now i am afraid i shall cry she took the chair which julian had placed for her turning her face aside so that neither of the men could see it one of her hands was pressed over her bosom the other hung listlessly at her side julian rose from the place that he had occupied horace neither moved nor spoke his head was on his breast the traces of tears on his cheeks owned mutely that she had touched his heart would he forgive her julian passed on and approached mercy's chair in silence he took the hand which hung at her side in silence he lifted it to his lips and kissed it as her brother might have kissed it she started but she never looked up some strange fear of discovery seemed to possess her horace she whispered timidly julian made no reply he went back to his place and allowed her to think it was horace the sacrifice was immense enough feeling toward her as he felt to be worthy of the man who made it a few minutes had been all she asked for in a few minutes she turned toward them again her sweet voice was steady once more her eyes rested softly on horace as she went on what was it possible for a friendless girl in my position to do when the full knowledge of the outrage had been revealed to me if i had possessed near and dear relatives to protect and advise me the wretches into whose hands i had fallen might have felt the penalty of the law 
i knew no more of the formalities which set the law in motion than a child but i had another alternative you will say charitable societies would have received me and helped me if i had stated my case to them i knew no more of the charitable societies than i knew of the law at least then i might have gone back to the honest people among whom i had lived when i received my freedom after the interval of some days i was ashamed to go back to the honest people helplessly and hopelessly without sin or choice of mine i drifted as thousands of other women have drifted into the life which set a mark on me for the rest of my days are you surprised at the ignorance which this confession reveals you who have your solicitors to inform you of legal remedies and your newspapers circulars and active friends to sound the praises of charitable institutions continually in your ears you who possess these advantages have no idea of the outer world of ignorance in which your lost fellow creatures live they know nothing unless they are rogues accustomed to prey on society of your benevolent schemes to help them the purpose of public charities and the way to discover and apply to them ought to be posted at the corner of every street what do we know of public dinners and eloquent sermons and neatly printed circulars every now and then the ease of some forlorn creature generally of a woman who has committed suicide within five minutes walk perhaps of an institution which would have opened its doors to her appears in the newspapers shocks you dreadfully and is then forgotten again take as much pains to make charities and asylums known among the people without money as are taken to make a new play a new journal or a new medicine known among the people with money and you will save many a lost creature who is perishing now you will forgive and understand me if i say no more of this period in my life let me pass to the new incident in my career which brought me for the second time before the public notice in a court of law sad as my experience has been it has not taught me to think ill of human nature i had found kind hearts to feel for me in my former troubles and i had friends faithful self-denying generous friends among my sisters in adversity now one of these poor women she has gone i am glad to think from the world that used her so hardly especially attracted to my sympathies she was the gentlest the most unselfish creature i have ever met with we lived together like sisters more than once in the dark hours when the thought of self-destruction comes to a desperate woman the image of my poor devoted friend left to suffer alone rose in my mind and restrained me you will hardly understand it but even we had our happy days when she or i had a few shillings to spare we used to offer one another little presents and enjoy our simple pleasure in giving and receiving as keenly as if we had been the most reputable women living one day i took my friend into a shop to buy her a ribbon only a bow for her dress she was to choose it and i was to pay for it and it was to be the prettiest ribbon that money could buy the shop was full we had to wait a little before we could be served next to me as i stood at the counter with my companion was a gaudily dressed woman looking at some handkerchiefs the handkerchiefs were finely embroidered but the smart lady was hard to please she tumbled them up disdainfully in a heap and asked for other specimens from the stock in the shop the man in clearing the handkerchiefs out of the way suddenly missed one he was quite sure of it from a peculiarity in the embroidery which made the handkerchief especially noticeable i was poorly dressed and i was close to the handkerchiefs after one look at me he shouted to the superintendent shut the door there is a thief in the shop the door was closed the lost handkerchief was vainly sought for on the counter and on the floor a robbery had been committed and i was accused of being the thief i will say nothing of what i felt i will only tell you what happened i was searched and the handkerchief was discovered on me the woman who had stood next to me on finding herself threatened with discovery 
had no doubt contrived to slip the stolen handkerchief into my pocket only an accomplished thief could have escaped detection in that way without my knowledge it was useless in the face of the facts to declare my innocence i had no character to appeal to my friend tried to speak for me but what was she only a lost woman like myself my landlady's evidence in favor of my honesty produced no effect it was against her that she let lodgings to people in my position i was prosecuted and found guilty the tale of my disgrace is now complete mr holmcroft no matter whether i was innocent or not the shame of it remains i have been imprisoned for theft the matron of the prison was the next person who took an interest in me she reported favorably of my behavior to the authorities and when i had served my time as the phrase was among us she gave me a letter to the kind friend and guardian of my later years to the lady who is coming here to take me back with her to the refuge from this time the story of my life is little more than the story of a woman's vain efforts to recover her lost place in the world the matron on receiving me into the refuge frankly acknowledged that there were terrible obstacles in my way but she saw that i was sincere and she felt a good woman's sympathy and compassion for me on my side i did not shrink from beginning the slow and weary journey back again to a reputable life from the humblest starting point from domestic service after first earning my new character in the refuge i obtained a trial in a respectable house i worked hard and worked uncomplainingly but my mother's fatal legacy was against me from the first my personal appearance excited remark my manners and habits were not the manners and habits of the women among whom my lot was cast i tried one place after another always with the same results suspicion and jealousy i could endure but i was defenceless when curiosity assailed me in its turn sooner or later inquiry led to discovery sometimes the servants threatened to give warning in a body and i was obliged to go sometimes where there was a young man in the family scandal pointed at me and at him and again i was obliged to go if you care to know it miss roseberry can tell you the story of those sad days i confided it to her on the memorable night when we met in the french cottage i have no heart to repeat it now after a while i wearied of the hopeless struggle despair laid its hold on me i lost all hope in the mercy of god more than once i walked to one or other of the bridges and looked over the parapet at the river and said to myself other women have done it why shouldn't i you saved me at that time mr gray as you have saved me since i was one of your congregation when you preached in the chapel of the refuge you reconciled others besides me to our hard pilgrimage in their name and in mine sir i thank you i forget how long it was after the bright day when you comforted and sustained us that war broke out between france and germany but i can never forget the evening when the matron sent for me into her own room and said my dear your life here is a wasted life if you have courage enough left to try it i can give you another chance i passed through a month of probation in a london hospital a week after that i wore the red cross of the geneva convention i was appointed nurse in a french ambulance when you first saw me mr holmcroft i still had my nurse's dress on hidden from you and from everybody under a gray cloak you know what the next event was you know how i entered this house i have not tried to make the worst of my trials and troubles in telling you what my life has been i have honestly described it for what it was when i met with miss roseberry a life without hope may you never know the temptation that tried me when the shell struck its victim in the french cottage there she lay dead her name was untainted her future promised me the reward which had been denied to the honest efforts of a penitent woman my lost place in the world was offered back to me on the one condition that i stooped to win it by a fraud i had no prospect to look forward to i had no friend near to advise me and to save me 
the fairest years of my womanhood had been wasted in the vain struggle to recover my good name such was my position when the possibility of personating miss roseberry first forced itself on my mind impulsively recklessly wickedly if you like i seized the opportunity and let you pass me through the german lines under miss roseberry's name arrived in england having had time to reflect i made my first and last effort to draw back before it was too late i went to the refuge and stopped on the opposite side of the street looking at it the old hopeless life of irretrievable disgrace confronted me as i fixed my eyes on the familiar door the horror of returning to that life was more than i could force myself to endure an empty cab passed me at the moment the driver held up his hand in sheer despair i stopped him and when he said where to in sheer despair again i answered mablethorpe house of what i have suffered in secret since my own successful deception established me under lady janet's care i shall say nothing many things which must have surprised you in my conduct are made plain to you by this time you must have noticed long since that i was not a happy woman now you know why my confession is made my conscience has spoken at last you are released from your promise to me you are free thank mr julian gray if i stand here self-accused of the offence that i have committed before the man whom i have wronged end of chapter twenty seven recording by warren cotty gurney illinois chapter twenty eight of the new magdalen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by warren cotty gurney illinois the new magdalen by wilkie collins chapter twenty eight sentence is pronounced on her it was done the last tones of her voice died away in silence her eyes still rested on horace after hearing what he had heard could he resist that gentle pleading look would he forgive her a while since julian had seen tears on his cheeks and had believed that he felt for her why was he now silent was it possible that he only felt for himself for the last time at the crisis of her life julian spoke for her he had never loved her as he loved her at that moment it tried even his generous nature to plead her cause with horace against himself but he had promised her without reserve all the help that her truest friend could offer faithfully and manfully he redeemed his promise horace he said horace slowly looked up julian rose and approached him she has told you to thank me if her conscience has spoken thank the noble nature which answered when i called upon it own the priceless value of a woman who can speak the truth her heartfelt repentance is a joy in heaven shall it not plead for her on earth honor her if you are a christian feel for her if you are a man he waited horace never answered him mercy's eyes turned tearfully on julian his heart was the heart that felt for her his words were the words which comforted and pardoned her when she looked back again at horace it was with an effort his last hold on her was lost in her inmost mind a thought rose unbidden a thought which was not to be repressed can i ever have loved this man she advanced a step toward him it was not possible even yet to completely forgot the past she held out her hand he rose on his side without looking at her before we part forever she said to him 
will you take my hand as a token that you forgive me he hesitated he half lifted his hand the next moment the generous impulse died away in him in its place came the mean fear of what might happen if he trusted himself to the dangerous fascination of her touch his hand dropped again at his side he turned away quickly i can't forgive her he said with that horrible confession without even a last look at her he left the room at the moment when he opened the door julian's contempt for him burst its way through all restraints horace he said i pity you as the words escaped him he looked back at mercy she had turned aside from both of them she had retired to a distant part of the library the first bitter foretaste of what was in store for her when she faced the world again had come to her from horace the energy which had sustained her thus far quailed before the dreadful prospect doubly dreadful to a woman of obloquy and contempt she sank on her knees before a little couch in the darkest corner of the room oh christ have mercy on me that was her prayer no more julian followed her he waited a little then his kind hand touched her his friendly voice fell consolingly on her ear rise poor wounded heart beautiful purified soul god's angels rejoice over you take your place among the noblest of god's creatures he raised her as he spoke all her heart went out to him she caught his hand she pressed it to her bosom she pressed it to her lips then dropped it suddenly and stood before him trembling like a frightened child forgive me was all she could say i was so lost and lonely and you are so good to me she tried to leave him it was useless her strength was gone she caught at the head of the couch to support herself he looked at her the confession of his love was just rising to his lips he looked again and checked it no not at that moment not when she was helpless and ashamed not when her weakness might make her yield only to regret it at a later time the great heart which had spared her and felt for her from the first spared her and felt for her now he too left her but not without a word at parting don't think of your future life just yet he said gently i have something to propose when rest and quiet have restored you he opened the nearest door the door of the dining-room and went out the servants engaged in completing the decoration of the dinner-table noticed when mr julian entered the room that his eyes were brighter than ever he looked they remarked like a man who expected good news they were inclined to suspect though he was certainly rather young for it that her ladyship's nephew was in a fair way of preferment in the church mercy seated herself on the couch there are limits in the physical organization of man to the action of pain when suffering has reached a given point of intensity the nervous sensibility becomes incapable of feeling more the rule of nature in this respect applies not only to sufferers in the body but to sufferers in the mind as well grief rage terror have also their appointed limits the moral sensibility like the nervous sensibility reaches its period of absolute exhaustion and feels no more the capacity for suffering in mercy had attained its term alone in the library she could feel the physical relief of repose she could vaguely recall julian's parting words to her and sadly wonder what they meant but she could do no more an interval passed a brief interval of perfect rest she recovered herself sufficiently to be able to look at her watch and to estimate the lapse of time that might yet pass before julian returned to her as he had promised while her mind was still languidly following this train of thought 
she was disturbed by the ringing of a bell in the hall used to summon the servant whose duties were connected with that part of the house in leaving the library horace had gone out by the door which led into the hall and had failed to close it she plainly heard the bell and a moment later more plainly still she heard lady janet's voice she started to her feet lady janet's letter was still in the pocket of her apron the letter which imperatively commanded her to abstain from making the very confession that had just passed her lips it was near the dinner hour and the library was the favorite place in which the mistress of the house and her guests assembled at that time it was no matter of doubt it was an absolute certainty that lady janet had only stopped in the hall on her way into the room the alternative for mercy lay between instantly leaving the library by the dining-room door or remaining where she was at the risk of being sooner or later compelled to own that she had deliberately disobeyed her benefactress exhausted by what she had already suffered she stood trembling and irresolute incapable of deciding which alternative she should choose lady janet's voice clear and resolute penetrated into the room she was reprimanding the servant who had answered the bell is it your duty in my house to look after the lamps yes my lady and is it my duty to pay you your wages if you please my lady why do i find the light in the hall dim and the wick of that lamp smoking i have not failed in my duty to you don't let me find you failing again in your duty to me never had lady janet's voice sounded so sternly in mercy's ear as it sounded now if she spoke with that tone of severity to a servant who had neglected a lamp what had her adopted daughter to expect when she discovered that her entreaties and her commands had been alike set at defiance having administered her reprimand lady janet had not done with the servant yet she had a question to put to him next where is miss roseberry in the library my lady mercy returned to the couch she could stand no longer she had not even resolution enough left to lift her eyes to the door lady janet came in more rapidly than usual she advanced to the couch and tapped mercy playfully on the cheek with two of her fingers you lazy child not dressed for dinner oh fee fee her tone was as playfully affectionate as the action which had accompanied her words in speechless astonishment mercy looked up at her always remarkable for the taste and splendor of her dress lady janet had on this occasion surpassed herself there she stood revealed in her grandest velvet her richest jewelry her finest lace with no one to entertain at the dinner-table but the ordinary members of the circle at mablethorpe house noticing this as strange to begin with mercy further observed for the first time in her experience that lady janet's eyes avoided meeting hers the old lady took her place companionably on the couch she ridiculed her lazy child's plain dress without an ornament of any sort on it with her best grace she affectionately put her arm round mercy's waist and rearranged with her own hand the disordered locks of mercy's hair but the instant mercy herself looked at her lady janet's eyes discovered something supremely interesting in the familiar objects that surrounded her on the library walls how were these changes to be interpreted to what possible conclusion did they point julian's profounder knowledge of human nature if julian had been present might have found a clue to the mystery he might have surmised incredible as it was that mercy's timidity before lady janet was fully reciprocated by lady janet's timidity before mercy it was even so the woman whose immovable composure had conquered grace roseberry's utmost insolence in the hour of her triumph the woman who without once flinching had faced every other consequence of her resolution 
to ignore mercy's true position in the house quailed for the first time when she found herself face to face with the very person for whom she had suffered and sacrificed so much she had shrunk from the meeting with mercy as mercy had shrunk from the meeting with her the splendor of her dress meant simply that when other excuses for delaying the meeting downstairs had all been exhausted the excuse for a long and elaborate toilet had been tried next even the moments occupied in reprimanding the servant had been moments seized on as the pretext for another delay the hasty entrance into the room the nervous assumption of playfulness in language and manner the evasive and wandering eyes were all referable to the same cause in the presence of others lady janet had successfully silenced the protest of her own inbred delicacy and inbred sense of honor in the presence of mercy whom she loved with a mother's love in the presence of mercy for whom she had stooped to deliberate concealment of the truth all that was high and noble in the woman's nature rose in her and rebuked her what will the daughter of my adoption the child of my first and last experience of maternal love think of me now that i have made myself an accomplice in the fraud of which she is ashamed how can i look her in the face when i have not hesitated out of selfish consideration for my own tranquillity to forbid that frank avowal of the truth which her finer sense of duty had spontaneously bound her to make those were the torturing questions in lady janet's mind while her arm was wound affectionately round mercy's waist while her fingers were busying themselves familiarly with the arrangement of mercy's hair thence and thence only sprang the impulse which set her talking with an uneasy affectation of frivolity of any topic within the range of conversation so long as it related to the future and completely ignored the present and the past the winter here is unendurable lady janet began i have been thinking grace about what we had better do next mercy started lady janet had called her grace lady janet was still deliberately assuming to be innocent of the faintest suspicion of the truth no resumed her ladyship affecting to misunderstand mercy's movement you are not to go up now and dress there is no time and i am quite ready to excuse you you are a foil to me my dear you have reached the perfection of shabbiness ah i remember when i had my whims and fancies too and when i looked well in anything i wore just as you do no more of that as i was saying i have been thinking and planning what we are to do we really can't stay here cold one day and hot the next what a climate as for society what do we lose if we go away there is no such thing as society now assemblies of well-dressed mobs meet at each other's houses tear each other's clothes tread on each other's toes if you are particularly lucky you sit on the staircase you get a tepid ice and you hear vapid talk in slang phrases all round you there is modern society if we had a good opera it would be something to stay in london for look at the program for the season on that table promising as much as possible on paper and performing as little as possible on the stage the same works sung by the same singers year after year to the same stupid people in short the dullest musical evenings in europe no the more i think of it the more plainly i perceive that there is but one sensible choice before us we must go abroad set that pretty head to work choose north or south east or west it's all the same to me where shall we go mercy looked at her quickly as she put the question lady janet more quickly yet looked away at the program of the opera house still the same melancholy false pretenses still the same useless and cruel delay incapable of enduring the position now forced upon her mercy put her hand into the pocket of her apron and drew from it lady janet's letter will your ladyship forgive me she began in faint faltering tones if i venture on a painful subject i hardly dare acknowledge in spite of her resolution to speak out plainly 
the memory of past love and past kindness prevailed with her the next words died away on her lips she could only hold up the letter lady janet declined to see the letter lady janet suddenly became absorbed in the arrangement of her bracelets i know what you daren't acknowledge you foolish child she exclaimed you daren't acknowledge that you are tired of this doll house my dear i am entirely of your opinion i am weary of my own magnificence i long to be living in one snug little room with one servant to wait on me i'll tell you what we will do we will go to paris in the first place my excellent miglior prince of couriers shall be the only person in attendance he shall take a lodging for us in one of the unfashionable quarters of paris we will rough it grace to use the slang phrase merely for a change we will lead what they call a bohemian life i know plenty of writers and painters and actors in paris the liveliest society in the world my dear until one gets tired of them we will dine at the restaurant and go to the play and drive about in shabby little hired carriages and when it begins to get monotonous which it is only sure to do we will spread our wings and fly to italy and cheat the winter in that way there is a plan for you miglior is in town i will send to him this evening and we will start to-morrow mercy made another effort i entreat your ladyship to pardon me she resumed i have something serious to say i am afraid i understand you are afraid of crossing the channel and you don't like to acknowledge it pooh the passage barely lasts two hours and we will shut ourselves up in a private cabin i will send at once the courier may be engaged ring the bell lady janet i must submit to my hard lot i cannot hope to associate myself again with any future plan of yours what you are afraid of our bohemian life in paris observe this grace if there is one thing i hate more than another it is an old head on young shoulders i say no more ring the bell this cannot go on lady janet no words can say how unworthy i feel of your kindness how ashamed i am upon my honor my dear i agree with you you ought to be ashamed at your age of making me get up to ring the bell her obstinacy was immovable she attempted to rise from the couch but one choice was left to mercy she anticipated lady janet and rang the bell the manservant came in he had his little letter tray in his hand with a card on it and a sheet of paper beside the card which looked like an open letter you know where my courier lives when he is in london asked lady janet yes my lady send one of the grooms to him on horseback i am in a hurry the courier is to come here without fail to-morrow morning in time for the tidal train to paris you understand yes my lady what have you got there anything for me for miss roseberry my lady as he answered the man handed the card and the open letter to mercy the lady is waiting in the morning-room miss she wished me to say she has time to spare and she will wait for you if you are not yet ready having delivered his message in those terms he withdrew mercy read the name on the card the matron had arrived she looked at the letter next it appeared to be a printed circular with some lines in pencil added on the empty page printed lines and written lines swam before her eyes she felt rather than saw lady janet's attention steadily and suspiciously fixed on her with the matron's arrival the foredoomed end of the flimsy false pretenses and the cruel delays had come a friend of yours my dear yes lady janet am i acquainted with her i think not lady janet you appear to be agitated does your visitor bring bad news is there anything that i can do for you you can add immeasurably add madam to all your past kindness if you will only bear with me and forgive me bear with you and forgive you i don't understand i will try to explain whatever else you may think of me lady janet for god's sake don't think me ungrateful lady janet held up her hand for silence 
i dislike explanations she said sharply nobody ought to know that better than you perhaps the lady's letter will explain for you why have you not looked at it yet i am in great trouble madam as you noticed just now have you any objection to my knowing who your visitor is no lady janet let me look at her card then mercy gave the matron's card to lady janet as she had given the matron's telegram to horace lady janet read the name on the card considered decided that it was a name quite unknown to her and looked next at the address western district refuge milburn road a lady connected with a refuge she said speaking to herself and calling here by appointment if i remember the servant's message a strange time to choose if she has come for a subscription she paused her brow contracted her face hardened a word from her would now have brought the interview to its inevitable end and she refused to speak the word to the last moment she persisted in ignoring the truth placing the card on the couch at her side she pointed with her long yellow-white forefinger to the printed letter lying side by side with her own letter on mercy's lap do you mean to read it or not she asked mercy lifted her eyes fast filling with tears to lady janet's face may i beg that your ladyship will read it for me she said and placed the matron's letter in lady janet's hand it was a printed circular announcing a new development in the charitable work of the refuge subscribers were informed that it had been decided to extend the shelter and the training of the institution thus far devoted to fallen women alone so as to include destitute and helpless children found wandering in the streets the question of the number of children to be thus rescued and protected was left dependent as a matter of course on the bounty of the friends of the refuge the cost of the maintenance of each child being stated at the lowest possible rate a list of influential persons who had increased their subscriptions so as to cover the cost and a brief statement of the progress already made with the new work completed the appeal and brought the circular to its end the lines traced in pencil in the matron's handwriting followed on the blank page your letter tells me my dear that you would like remembering your own childhood to be employed when you return among us in saving other poor children left helpless on the world our circular will inform you that i am able to meet your wishes my first errand this evening in your neighborhood was to take charge of a poor child a little girl who stands sadly in need of our care i have ventured to bring her with me thinking she might help to reconcile you to the coming change in your life you will find us both waiting to go back with you to the old home i write this letter instead of saying it hearing from the servant that you are not alone and being unwilling to intrude myself as a stranger on the lady of the house lady janet read the penciled lines as she had read the printed sentences aloud without a word of comment she laid the letter where she had laid the card and rising from her seat stood for a moment in stern silence looking at mercy the sudden change in her which the letter had produced quietly as it had taken place was terrible to see on the frowning brow in the flashing eyes on the hardened lips outraged love and outraged pride looked down on the lost woman and said as if in words you have roused us at last if that letter means anything she said it means you are about to leave my house there can be but one reason for you taking such a step as that it is the only atonement i can make madam i see another letter on your lap is it my letter yes have you read it i have read it have you seen horace holmcroft yes have you told horace holmcroft oh lady janet don't interrupt me have you told horace holmcroft what my letter positively forbade you to communicate either to him or to any living creature i want no protestations and excuses answer me instantly and answer in one word yes or no not even that haughty language not even those pitiless tones could extinguish in mercy's heart 
the sacred memories of past kindness and past love she fell on her knees her outstretched hands touched lady janet's dress lady janet sharply drew her dress away and sternly repeated her last words yes or no yes she had owned it at last to this end lady janet had submitted to grace roseberry had offended horace holmcroft had stooped for the first time in her life to concealments and compromises that degraded her after all that she had sacrificed and suffered there mercy knelt at her feet self-convicted of violating her commands trampling on her feelings deserting her house and who was the woman who had done this the same woman who had perpetrated the fraud and who had persisted in the fraud until her benefactress had descended to become her accomplice then and then only she had suddenly discovered that it was her sacred duty to tell the truth in proud silence the great lady met the blow that had fallen on her in proud silence she turned her back on her adopted daughter and walked to the door mercy made her last appeal to the kind friend whom she had offended to the second mother whom she had loved lady janet lady janet don't leave me without a word oh madam try to feel for me a little i am returning to a life of humiliation the shadow of my old disgrace is falling on me once more we shall never meet again even though i have not deserved it let my repentance plead with you say you forgive me lady janet turned round on the threshold of the door i never forgive ingratitude she said go back to the refuge the door opened and closed on her mercy was alone again in the room unforgiven by horace unforgiven by lady janet she put her hands to her burning head and tried to think oh for the cool air of the night oh for the friendly shelter of the refuge she could feel those sad longings in her it was impossible to think she rang the bell and shrank back the instant she had done it had she any right to take that liberty she ought to have thought of it before she rang habit all habit how many hundreds of times she had rung the bell at mablethorpe house the servant came in she amazed the man she spoke to him so timidly she even apologized for troubling him i'm sorry to disturb you will you be so kind as to say to the lady that i am ready for her wait to give that message said a voice behind them until you hear the bell rung again mercy looked round in amazement julian had returned to the library by the dining-room door end of chapter twenty eight recording by warren cotty gurney illinois Chapter Twenty Nine of the New Magdalene. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The New Magdalene by Wilkie Collins. Chapter Twenty Nine: The Last Trial. Mister Gray, she exclaimed, "Why have you delayed my message? If you knew all." You would know that it is far from being a kindness to keep me in this house he advanced closer to her surprised by her words alarmed by her looks has any one been here in my absence he asked lady janet has been here in your absence i, I can't speak of it my heart feels crushed I can bear no more let me go briefly as she had replied she had said enough julian's knowledge of lady janet's character told him what had happened his face showed plainly that he was disappointed as well as distressed i had hoped to have been with you when you and my aunt met and to have prevented this he said believe me she will atone for all she may have harshly and hastily done when she's had time to think try not to regret it if she has made your hard sacrifice harder still she has only raised you the higher she has additionally ennobled you and endeared you in my estimation forgive me if i own this in plain words 
i cannot control myself i feel too strongly at other times mercy might have heard the coming of a vowel in his tones might have discovered it in his eyes as it was her delicate insight was dulled her fine perception was blunted she held out her hand to him feeling a vague conviction that he was kinder to her than ever and feeling no more i must thank you for the last time she said as long as life is left my gratitude will be part of my life let me go while i can still control myself let me go she tried to leave him and ring the bell he held her hand firmly and drew her closer to him to the refuge he asked yes she said home again don't say that he exclaimed i can't bear to hear it don't call the refuge your home what else is it where else can i go i come here to tell you i said if you remember i had something to propose she felt the fervent pressure of his hand she saw the mounting enthusiasm flashing in his eyes her weary mind roused itself a little she began to tremble under the electric influence of his touch something to propose she repeated what is there to propose let me ask you a question on my side what have you done today you know what i have done it's your work she answered humbly why return to it now i return to it for the last time i return to it with a purpose which you will soon understand you have abandoned your marriage engagement you have forfeited lady janet's love you have ruined all your worldly prospects and you are now returning self-devoted to a life which you yourself have described as a life without hope and all this you have done of your own free will at a time when you are absolutely secure of your position in the house for the sake of speaking the truth now tell me is a woman who can make that sacrifice a woman who will prove unworthy of trust if a man places her in keeping his honour and his name she understood him at last she broke away from him with a cry she stood with her hands clasped trembling and looking at him he gave her no time to think the words poured from his lips without conscious will or conscious effort of his own mercy from the first moment when i saw you i loved you you are free i may own it i may ask you to be my wife she drew back from him further and further with a wild imploring gesture of her hand no no she cried think of what you're saying think of what you would sacrifice it cannot must not be his face darkened with a sudden dread his head fell on his breast his voice sank so low that she could barely hear it i've forgotten something he said you have reminded me of it she ventured back a little nearer to him have i offended you he smiled sadly you have enlightened me i had forgotten that it doesn't follow because i love you that you should love me in return say that is so mercy and i leave you a faint tinge of colour rose on her face and left it again paler than ever her eyes looked down timidly under the eager gaze that he fastened on her how can i say so she answered simply where is a woman in my place whose heart could resist you eagerly he advanced he held out his arms to her in breathless speechless joy she drew back from him once more with a look that horrified him a look of blank despair am i fit to be your wife she asked must i remind you of what you owe to your high position your spotless integrity your famous name think of all that you have done for me and think of the black ingratitude of it if i ruin your life by consenting to our marriage if i selfishly cruelly wickedly drag you down to the level of a woman like me i can raise you to my level when i make you my wife he answered for heaven's sake do me justice don't refer me to the world and its opinions it rests with you and you alone to make the misery of the happiness of my life the world good god what can the world give me in exchange for you she clasped her hands imploringly the tears flowed fast over her cheeks oh have pity on my weakness she cried kindest best of men help me to do my duty toward you it is so hard after all that i have suffered when my heart is yearning peace and happiness and love she checked herself shuddering at the words that had escaped her remember how mr holmcroft has used me remember how lady janet left me remember what i have told you of my life the scorn of every creature you know would strike at you through me no 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 not a word more spare me pity me leave me her voice failed her her sobs choked her utterance he sprang to her and took her in his arms 
she was incapable of resisting him but there was no yielding in her her head lay on his bosom passive horribly passive like the head of a corpse mercy my darling we will go away we will leave england we will take refuge among new people in a new world i will change my name i will break with relatives friends everybody anything anything rather than lose you she lifted her head slowly and looked at him he suddenly released her he reeled back like a man staggered by a blow and dropped her into a chair before she had uttered a word he saw the terrible resolution in her face death rather than yield to her own weakness and disgrace him she stood with her hand lightly clasped in front of her her grand head was raised her soft grey eyes shone again undimmed by tears a storm of emotion had swept over her and had passed away a sad tranquillity was in her face a gentle resignation was in her voice the calm of a martyr was the calm that confronted him as she spoke her last words a woman who has lived my life a woman who has suffered what i have suffered may love you as i love you but she must not be your wife that place is too high above her any other place is too far below her and below you she paused advancing to the bell gave the signal for her departure that done she slowly retraced her steps until she stood at julian's side tenderly she lifted his head and laid it for a moment on her bosom silently she stooped and touched his forehead with her lips all the gratitude that filled her heart and all the sacrifice that rent it were in those two actions so modestly so tenderly performed as the last lingering pressure of her fingers left him julian burst into tears the servant answered the bell the moment he opened the door a woman's voice was audible in the hall speaking to him let the child go in the voice said i will wait here the child appeared the same forlorn little creature who had reminded mercy of her own early years on the day when she and harris holmcroft had been out for their walk there was no beauty in this child no halo of romance brightened by the commonplace horror of her story she came cringing into the room staring stupidly at the magnificence all around her the daughter of the london streets pet creation of the laws of political economy the savage and terrible product of a worn-out system of government and of a civilization rotten to its core clean for the first time in her life fed sufficiently for the first time in her life dressed in clothes instead of rags for the first time in her life mercy's sister in adversity crept fearfully over the beautiful carpet and stopped wonderstruck before the marbles of an inlaid table a blot of mud on the splendour of the room mercy turned from julian to meet the child the woman's heart hungering in its horrible isolation for something that might harmlessly love welcomed the rescued waif of the streets as a consolation sent from god she caught the stupefied little creature up in her arms kiss me she whispered in the reckless agony of the moment call me sister the child stared vacantly sister meant nothing to her mind but an older girl who was strong enough to beat her she put the child down again and turned for a last look at the man whose happiness she had wrecked in pity to him he never moved his head was down his face was hidden she went back to him a few steps the others have gone from me without one kind word can you forgive me he held out his hand to her without looking up sorely as she had wounded him his generous nature understood her true to her from the first he was true to her still god bless and comfort you he said in broken tones the earth holds no nobler woman than you she knelt and kissed the hand that pressed hers for the last time it doesn't end with this world she whispered there's a better world to come and she rose and went back to the child hand in hand the two citizens of the government of god outcasts of the government of man passed slowly down the length of the room then out into the hall then out into the night the heavy clang of the closing door told the knell of their departure they were gone but the orderly routine of the house inexorable as death pursued its appointed course as the clock struck the hour the dinner-bell rang 
an interval of a minute passed and marked the limit of delay the butler appeared in the dining room dinner is served sir julian looked up the empty room met his eyes something white lay on the carpet close by him it was her handkerchief wet with her tears he took it up and pressed it to his lips was that to be the last of her had she left him for ever the native energy of the man arming itself with all the might of his love kindled in him again no while life was in him while time was before him there was hope of winning her yet he turned to the servant reckless of what his face might betray where is lady janet in the dining-room sir he reflected for a moment his own influence had failed through what other influence could he now hope to reach her as the question crossed his mind the light broke on him he saw the way back to her through the influence of lady janet her ladyship is waiting sir julian entered the dining-room End of chapter 29